Thank you everyone for joining us for the Bite Size Learning Session. Hello, my name is John Moynihan with the Program Support Center. We will be recording this session. Welcome to this edition of the Bite Size Learning Sessions hosted by the Program Support Center who lead the Go Green Get Healthy HHS Sustainability Team. The topic for today is reducing plastic pollution and improving human health. We will be doing a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. You are welcome to put your comments and your questions in the chat box. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment via audio, you can select the raise your hand icon and we can call on you. Then just unmute your mic. We will be sending a post event survey. The recording of the session we will be posted on the Go Green Get Healthy HHS playlist on the HHS YouTube channel in the next few weeks. We will thrill to have with us our guest speaker, Aaron Simon. Aaron is vice president and head of plastic waste and business at the World Wildlife Fund. In her role, Erin drives positive change across industries in packaging and material sustainability. In addition to help spearhead the World Wildlife Fund's initiative, No Plastic in Nature, Erin has led the development of thought leadership and programs to transform the way the world, and specifically business, fights the plastic waste crisis. Before the World Wildlife Fund, Erin was a packaging engineer at Hewlett Packard for 10 years responsible for the design and implementation of laser jet printer and media packaging. Erin, we are grateful that you can join us today. A warm welcome to you from HHS. Thank you so much. Without further ado, Erin, uh, please take it away. Okay, let me get my slides up here for y'all. Are you seeing some uh, slides there, John? Just verifying. Yes. Perfect. Sure, sure All right, can. let me go to present. Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Love technology. Thanks. All we of love us. It too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Hopefully we'll get going and I'll have minor technology glitches. Um, it's really nice to meet everybody um, and excited to be here to chat with you a bit about um, the challenge of the plastic pollution crisis and what World Wildlife Fund is doing to address it. Um, I always like to get started by giving a quick introduction to who WWF is in the context of this issue. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, recognize the brand and the panda, um, but really we are, we go even, we're, we're, we're broader than just species. Um, WWF is one of the world's largest conservation networks. Um, we have programs in over a hundred countries and our mission is really about helping people in nature thrive by conserving wildlife, protecting those environments they depend on, and of course, addressing the ever looming climate crisis. Uh, we do this by leading with science-based solutions and those that are local to places to address some of the most uh, pressing challenges facing our world today. And we do that with what we like to call this one planet perspective. Um, all the elements you see here um, from the wildlife, the forest, the oceans, the freshwater uh, ecosystems to our food and climate systems, they're all connected. Um, and so we must to solve any major global issue, you have to ensure that you're always acting in the best interest of all of these things as the planet of a whole. Um, and that's especially important in uh, when we're thinking about the climate crisis, I mean, sorry, the plastic pollution crisis. Um, I think we're all quite familiar with images like this, um, showing the devastation that the plastic uh, pollution crisis is placing on species. Uh, it is choking our planet. Uh, and polluting the air, water, and soil people and wildlife depend on. In fact, every minute of every day, a dump truck worth of plastic pollution is flowing into our oceans alone. And all of that, of all of that plastic that's ever been made, only 5% of it has actually ever been recycled. So what we have found is that this means that over 2000 species have been directly impacted um, by plastic pollution, either through entanglement, ingestion, and habit or habitat degradation. And that's not just species, right? These are local coastline communities to people who depend on um, these the coastal waters and the fish for livelihood and food. Um, and in addition to that, it has negative impacts on human health, right? Plastic, the production of plastic 
um, which over 99% of, of which comes from fossil fuels today, harms local communities and production workers through exposure to high quantities of air and water pollution. And this is linked to higher rates of cancer, asthma, endocrine disruptions, and other issues. So reducing plastic production and ensuring that any necessary production has community safeguards is a really, it's a really critical aspect to protecting these vulnerable communities. Um, many plastics also include harmful chemicals and additives such as per and uh, sorry, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and these can leach out of products into our food, water, and air um, systems and cause human illnesses and disabilities. Um, plastics can also release microplastics. Um, these can have significant environmental implications um, and have been documented in all parts of the human body. Now we are still learning what that means, right? We know it's there, but what's the implication? Well, we've got some new research that's showing that uh, microplastics may damage or block the lungs, heart, and other parts of the body. So while we know that plastics can provide health benefits, right? We've gone through a pandemic, so PPE and sterilization, um, and they also um, can be helpful in really technical solutions their potential health and environmental impacts warrant careful consideration and action to minimize the harm associated with the use and production. And so that's what I wanna talk about. So what is WWF's solution to this? Well, we know that the time for action is now, right? The impact I have shared, the urgency of this issue um, means that we can no longer go with business as usual. We need this holistic systems change that really touches on changes from reduction, reuse, substitution of materials, recycling, and of course, better waste management. Um, we need solutions at many levels. Um, and from all actors, and we need everyone to take action now, right? It's sort of like the all hands on deck idea uh, because everybody plays a really key role in, in the solution. Um, no one thing is going to solve all of this. You've probably heard all this before. This issue has been very mainstream for a while, but I wanna dig in a bit more because for WWF, as we engage with all of these different actors, um, our theory of change is the same, where our ask to them is the same. And that is first, let's get eliminate unnecessary plastic, right? Like to decrease the total volume of plastic being created, used and flowing into nature, we need to start with getting rid of it. Today, plastic production is set to double by 2040 unless we do this. So eliminating what we don't need is critical. Next, we need to shift to sustainable sources for the plastics we still continue to use, right? This is needed for us to decouple the impacts of fossil fuels, right? 99% of plastic is made from that. So by moving to recycled content and more responsibly sourced bio base. And then finally, we need to improve our material systems so that we can collect, reuse, recycle, or compost all the plastics we use. In short, for all stakeholders, we need to use less, make what we do use better, and keep it in the loop so we can use it over and over again. So for the first group of partners that we are engaging, we work a lot with businesses. We engage with companies and we ask them to play a part throughout the system by helping them to understand where their impact is. A lot of that starts with our resource work that we're doing. Um, and then through that, and I will dig into that a little bit more, we also then get them to advocate more, whether that's at the state level, or I mean, and the national level, like one source here, um, engage with your peers in a place like the US Plastic Pact, engage globally on the treaty negotiations in the business coalition, or be thought leaders on advancing solutions. So the Bioplastic Foodstock Alliance is one about looking at how you sh make that shift. But importantly, it really starts with that first footprint, right? What are you making? Um, and so for resource plastic, this is really um, the way we help companies move from commitment um, to action. And it's a really a simple thought process that I think is, is helpful for all actors in really considering how they can play a role in addressing their plastic, um, their plastic pollution footprint, if you will, right? So in this program, we um, help companies to measure what they're making, what it's made from, where it comes from, what is it made into and where it goes in the world, and then what happens to it there? Is it 
incinerated? Is it landfilled? Is it leaked or mismanaged? Or is it reused, recycled, composted, right? It is in that way that you can really understand truly where your impact lies. Um, and that way, once you can measure it, create that transparency, then you can find out what actions you as an organization, a company, a government, an individual can take to maximize your benefit, right? Making the actions that address your impact uh, taking the actions that address your impact really strategically and thoughtfully. And then where can you do that with others, right? Where can you collectively act? And this is really key in the plastic crisis is that we are not each of us going off on our own solution path, that we are working collectively around um, changing that system together because while we each individually engage with it, the system itself is shared, right? How we buy, sell, collect, recover, and reuse materials. Um, I think a great example of this is something that Starbucks did based on this. So eliminating unnecessary plastic, right? That's the first piece of the theory of change is a really important first step for companies, right? Getting rid of the stuff they don't need. Well, Starbucks is one of the several restaurant chains that um, have committed to banning plastic straws in recent years. Plastic straws are what we call problematic plastics because they're size, design, they're pretty difficult to collect, all almost impossible to recycle, which means they are often one of those things that ends up polluting our environments, right? Um, and so I think there are ways where um, organizations, individuals, or HHS, right, you can look at your internal procurement processes and understand what are those problematic plastics, such as cutlery, plastic drink stirs, um, or other things that are on the U.S. Plastic Pact problematic and unnecessary list that everybody is sort of agreeing these are the things that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to invest in infrastructure to manage. We're just going to stop making them. And this is the actions that we have been working on for over a decade with companies, really sort of pushing them to set targets, pushing them to take action, to measure their footprint. And what we have found is that while there's a lot of energy around that, we, we, we clearly understand that that voluntary action is not quite enough, right? You need to match that with that um, regulation at the national, international level so that there can be, you know, there's so the enabling conditions are in place, right? Um, you can reduce you, what you're using and design it really well, but if you don't have infrastructure to recycle it, you're never gonna get access to that recycled content. You can put a whole bunch of reusable products on the marketplace, but if there isn't the process to collect it, the behavior change and the fee system that allows you to move those reusables around, we're not gonna have reuse systems, right? It's that pair that's pairing up a bit. And so it's really been exciting to see that you've had this influx of voluntary action um, and even regulation at the national level, but that the international community has come together on this too. Remember all of these material supply chains, they don't adhere to country borders, right? Um, and therefore neither does that plastic pollution. So our solutions for this whole thing need to be coordinated at the highest level. Um, so really great news, right? And I imagine a lot of you track on this in 2022, the United Nations Environment Assembly convened to debate the global plastic crisis and unanimously 175 member states voted to, a, to adopt a, um, a resolution to negotiate a treaty to end plastic pollution. Um, exciting because they agreed to address the whole life cycle and they agreed to address it on an accelerated timeline, which has been exhausted for all, exhausting for all of us involved and have that treaty in place as soon as that's right next year, 2025. Um, but this is a huge step, right? Because no major international issue that we have ever placed as a, uh, sorry, faced as a planet has ever been tackled at scale without international alignment, right? It's a common set of rules that everybody plays by to address that shared threat. Um, and that demonstrates that level of global collaboration and coordinated action that we know is essential to really address the scope of this crisis. Um, and above all, it sends that message. It sends a message that the world is, has agreed that this is an important issue to, and it's a top priority. And that in itself will drive innovation and accelerate the solutions that are in progress. Um, if you're following this, the timeline has been quite quickly over the last of those five negotiating sessions that are necessary or required part of the treaty process. Um, we've already finished four. Um, in a few months, we're going to be heading into South Korea. 
uh, to have maybe that fifth and final year. Um, WWF is a part of all of this. Our delegation has been on the ground to help continue to keep pressure for the level of ambition that's necessary to end plastic pollution for our planet, but also to help encourage and, and facilitate that partnership that's needed between government and business to really drive this. You know, every negotiation we have, the stakes continue to get higher, right? We're moving closer and closer to what that final treaty could be. Um, and that's that's really important. It's really been a fascinating process to observe. But overall, the momentum to address plastic pollution right now is incredible. And with or without a treaty, that momentum is continuing to mobilize, right? And so I think as each of us as actors who become passionate about this, we have um, we have a, a role to play in that and keeping that momentum alive. So let's bring it back to the US a little bit, right? Um, and what we're thinking about in the US landscape. The way that we've seen a lot of engagement happen um, and be mobilized by both this treaty and by that voluntary force that's coming from the private sector is a lot of appetite at all levels of US government. Um, we've got executive action, we've got congressional action and state level action. And we've been really trying to help support all of those. Um, some key examples of how we've been engaging with um, different levels is through, um, as you can see on this list, I'm just gonna touch on a few, extended producer responsibility. This is also known as EPR. Um, this is the thing that can shift the burden of funding the collection and disposal of plastic packaging and other products such as paper from the consumer or the mayor or the local municipality to the producer, right? To those who are putting the products on the marketplace. EPR really increases the investment in those systems, the recycling, and incentivizes product redesign and um, the reduction of those problematic materials and enables a strong lip market for it. Um, businesses want EPR in the US. You've been seeing them advocate for it in the five policies that exist at the state level, um, and they are doing a lot of education and 101 sessions with those on the Hill uh, to talk about it because it's truly bipartisan. Um, also, there are, uh, there are other things we can do to address more upstream impacts of plastics, right? So the Protecting Communities Against Plastic Act. And this one would require studies on the impacts of production facilities, the new limit, uh, new permit limits um, for facilities under existing legislation, impro improving performance standards for facilities, of course, requiring environmental justice and um, impact, health impact assessments, um, because this, can, this is the type of policy that can really address the health issues of the plastic production and pollution, where you'll hear over and over again, while EPR and recycling is an important part of it, of circularity, of getting that system together, it doesn't address the human health impacts directly. Um, finally, you are seeing that the administration is hearing this, and I'm sure as uh, one of the agencies, you are, you are, you know, really in the middle of this, right? On July 19th, the Biden-Harris administration announced those two new commitments around phasing out single-use plastics. Sorry, I did not mean to pop us forward one. Um, by um, phasing out single-use products, um, by that are across the US federal agencies by 2035 and doing that in food service packaging and events by 2027. Um, it also put out a great report outlining the necessary steps for that whole of government approach, right? How you all are working together with your different authorities and areas of control to how you can assess and reduce um, pollution from production all the way through innovative materials to design, to decrease waste generation, to improving waste management, collection, capture, and removal. Um, we're excited to see that HHS is already taking steps to eliminate single-use products and encourage reusable, reusables through procurement and cafeterias. So excited to dig into that more. But as we do this, right, as I said, my call to action for a business, my call to action for the government, and my call to action for individuals, it, it's all the same, right? We need to assess um, what we are what we are using, how we can reduce it, and how we can make sure that anything we are using can be recovered. Um, I like to remind individuals that this is not about being perfect. Um, it is about making smart choices when you can, so you can feel good and empowered and continue to support elevated asks in the future. Um, I've got a few here. They're not going to surprise you. Reuse is the beginning of this. What are those single-use plastics in your day-to-day -day lives that you can replace with a reusable today? Reusable water bottles, reusable totes. 
Um, I got a kid who's in school. I don't know about you, but daily lunch packing, uh, we try to buy in bulk and then put it in reusable for snacks. Um, don't just recycle. Recycle smart. No, today it is not easy in the United States to recycle. I understand that and we're trying to fix that. But right now, what you can recycle is dependent upon what you're, the company who's managing your recycling. So find out what they take and put the things in there that they take. My mother is a notorious wish cycler. I love her. She wants the best. And so she puts everything in that blue bin. She, she hopes they will recycle. The problem is that contaminates the bin. So don't wish cycle, recycle smart. Um, and I think the last thing that is most important and I think is the easiest thing we can all do is plastic pollution is everywhere. It is in our city sidewalks. It's in our parks. I mean, it is at the depths of the Mariana Trench all the way up to Mount Everest. So as we are out and about in our daily lives, in our, in our travels, on our vacations, we can pick it up. We can pick that waste up and find a tra like a place to put it because that, it, you know, it has no place in nature. So um, with that, I think I'm going to end my presentation and um, we can have an opportunity for questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. So I, <clears throat> we, there's some questions that have shown up in the chat and I'll start working through those. Um, but it, it does sound like there's a, you're, you're working on really um, starting at the source and working to make sure plastics are, um, are, are a little more uniform and understandable yeah. because, you know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of concern about recycling. And I love, I mean, I love what you said. We all have a certain amount of wish recycler in us, <laughs> but we do need to be very careful about that. And, and um, I just want to add there are ways to find out. Earth911.org yep. does a really good job at, if there's some nuances, like say your, your curbside isn't taking a certain type of plastic, you can get on there and try to find out where in your community you might be able to take it. But Recycle that being check said, is another one. Recycle check can also work. There's a lot of okay, good of those. Great. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's good. Recycle Nation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, as far as recycling plastics is now, there's there's a lot of questions behind, um, are we even, is, is plastic recycling even a, happening? And is that in and of itself uh, detri detrimental to the environment? And I don't know if you have any background on this and can talk about a little bit about the current state of of plastic recycling and what's happening when when that goes off to be recycled what really happens to it and how do they recycle it yeah i want to qualify that right now recycling especially globally but especially in the us is very much broken it is not working the way we need it to and there are a number of reasons for that one virgin plastic today is really cheap two the cost to recycle is more than it is to put that trash in a landfill. And so if a recycling facility, a material recycling facility over MRF does not have good contracts or long-term contracts for that recycled content to cover the cost to recycle it, it will landfill it. And three, the reason it doesn't have those contracts is because today there is no design guidelines and requirements. There's not enough funding to go into these facilities. The product portfolio is too broad for what the facilities can manage. And therefore there's just not the efficiencies. So we need to solve all of that. Extended mm -hmm. producer responsibility, design guidelines, getting rid of those problematic things like straws, stir sticks, forks, knives, colorants that don't, you know, that degrade the quality of like a PET. These are all steps that need to be taken to improve and get to cost parity with that system. So yeah, it's not working today. Today, what I can ask of an individual is not to fix the recycling system. It's just to work within the system they have so it is the highest quality bail it can be. In the meantime, we need to get governments and businesses to help fix that system so it, that not only we can have more consistent recycling systems and ones that provide high quality, high value materials, but reuse systems and all those other things that allow us to truly have that, um, you know, a shared system that cascades the value over and over again of these materials. Right, right. Yeah, someone brought up the point, obviously, about how cheap plastics are, and that's why in business they want to use it. 
Um, and I know you you're working with a lot of private companies to try to get them to make the changes. And you mentioned some have done it voluntarily, um, but the biggest change is going to have to come through policy. I think we all understand, but um, are there any kind of uh, incentives that that is being looked at or uh, some sort of cost effective alternatives or programs that are going to become part of these policies? Try to get these businesses to buy in. Yeah, and I want to highlight that the businesses are already bought in. In many cases, okay. a lot of the large brands, Coca-Cola, Walmart, Pepsi, Mars, S.G. Johnson, these folks are sitting next to me when I go to the Hill to educate on EPR, and they're saying, you know, help us partner with you to create these systems because they need these materials back, right? They also need better design guidelines so they can have higher quality materials so they can make those longer term contracts and get more like economically feasible feedstocks. That said, to do that in an extended producer responsibility policy, you need you can use eco, you can use economic incentives and disincentives in the design guidelines. Some people call this um, eco modulation. But basically, it's the fee modulation. It's the price you pay based on how uh, you're meeting those design standards. So say you put a um, a product in there and it is meeting the design cycle, the design standards for that system. So it provides the most efficient um, recycling of that material as it's designed, you pay one fee. If you add problematic chemicals of concern, create human health issues. And so the handlers need to have PPE, or they need to bail it separately and it increases the cost, then you're economically disincentivized with a higher cost to process that. In al Alternatively, we could incentivize better choices using more recycled content, using more, um, you know, definitely design things that are more responsibly sourced in the first place, and you could get a discount, right? It allows you to drive that through the system's targets. Um, Excuse me, my puppy just came in and is rolling around, and I apologize if that's <laughs> creating background noise. Um, but yeah, that's the way that you you put that fee modulation into it to to create those incentives, and you allow the outcomes of the recycling or reuse system around efficiency and emissions and energy use to really drive how drive the innovation to to meet those targets. Okay, great. Um, I think at this point, maybe we'll go and we'll take a, a, a question from um, Isha. Isha, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Would you like to ask yeah. a question? Isha, I will uh, unmute your mic and then you can just unmute, unmute your mic okay. yourself. Um, let me see. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, all right. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much, Aaron, for this lovely presentation. Uh, very enlightening and a um, lot of good information. Uh, my question to you stems from uh, initially you went over the health impacts, which I think a lot of folks are aware of. They're very, very scary. Um, so my question to you is these companies, like especially these chemical companies who are doing research and development to quote unquote, I'm using air quotes here, recycle plastics. Right, like that seems to be the big thing, right? We know that plastic um, produces all these health impacts, waste impacts humans, it impacts the environment. And these chemical companies are really trying and have been trying for the past, I think, five to 10 years to try to quote unquote recycle plastics. And when they recycle it, they heat it up, they incinerate it, right? So, and we know about forever chemicals, and when you heat up plastic, it leaches. Um, you know, the forever chemicals into the air, the carbon monoxide, the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, um, all these bad things that impact the air quality as well as um, the environment, as well as the water. Um, so what is WWF doing to address that? Because I think that you have a multi-pronged approach, which is great, um, you know, and, and especially at the individual level, you're working with the governments and, and organizations and, and giving tips on what folks can do. But what about these chemical companies? Because they are um, really, uh, I think, doing a lot of harm and like under this like umbrella of, oh, we're just going to recycle and it's going to be helpful. So obviously they can um, market that and it, it impacts their bottom line that, you know, we found out a way how to recycle this. So how does how does WWF see that and what are um, you doing, if anything, to address those, com those companies? Because I know a lot of them are getting sued by governments um, like the cities and, and counties. So uh, curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, with, you know, 
like when you talk about the sets of solutions, right? And I said, not one of these is the golden solution, right? You have to do all, right? When you hear those producers, those ones who want to continue to produce, talk constantly about, well, we are going to fix recycling so we can just recycle more. Um, you understand that that is not addressing all of the solutions, right? We need to, we have, today we can't manage to recycle what we have and we're supposed to double that in less than 15 years, there's no way we're gonna catch up, right? So it has to start with reduction. And that is always what we push for. In fact, that's why you, I mean, you just heard Biden and Harris push out with their new position in the treaty negotiations that we have to look at production reduction. Um, and with these producers, we are absolutely engaging them on a couple of things. One, how are you reducing in the first place? How are you addressing that? And also, as you are looking to recycle, how are you considering those human health implications, right? How are you advocating for the right, um, like uh, permitting and emissions on the, on and, and I'm talking about air, water, and soil emissions that come from chemical or mechanical recycling, um, and how are you adhering to transparency, which allows us to know what's in those to be able to manage them correctly, right? So we do not partner directly with oil and gas companies, um, but we are constantly working to engage them effectively around this issue. They, you know, um, and they have notoriously, as you said, uh, been advocating for one solution, which is recycling, which honestly makes it sound like recycling in itself is the problem. And while we need to fix that, we also need to reduce and we also need to reuse. And so you have to do all those things, not just recycle. So I hope that helps you. I don't, I'm not sure if I answer completely. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And um, would love to uh, touch base with you further. I know there's a lot of other questions, but um, do you have contact information? I do. And I can go ahead and what I can do is I can, um, I'll put that up on a slide. Well, I don't actually have it on this deck. I'll just put my contact information in, um, in the chat while we're going. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Problem. Excuse me. Maybe we can have um, the other question with a hand up. Um, I'm sure if that's Alex. Or Julie. I think Ju Ju uh, Julie. Um, can't tell if that's the last name or first go ahead, name. Julie, Please. you can unmute your, your mic. So. Um, you can unmute, unmute your mic, Julie. Okay. Um, Julie, can you hear oh, us? Sorry, I can hear. My apologies. <laughs> um, th thank you so much, Aaron, for this learning opportunity. I love it. And um, I'm going to come at you with a question that's not as a big picture as we've been focusing on. I'm on the very grassroots level here in the DMV, uh, educating and pr promoting plastic free and sustainable living. And I'm 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 trying to do it um, through a fun event format. So just another voice trying to reach people in a, in yeah. a slightly different way. And right. what's ha what's happening to me is I have um, a lot of people come because we're such a the area is such an event based town. I have a lot of people coming at me and asking really fundamental basic questions like, "Tell me, I want to give away." things at my event table and I want to package my treats in plastic bags and I, tell me what I can use as alternatives and I have searched packaging companies and I'm being put in the position of trying to I always say to people we're community organizers we're not experts on this topic but because I, we recognize how serious and all the landmines that you can step into when you try to play a role like that. And um, and we lean on other organizations to help guide us. But for the people like us who are at the very, very grassroots level hearing all these things, I'm just wondering if you have, you know, it's a billion dollar industry, this event industry of all this small stuff that cannot be recycled, right? So I'm wondering if you have a resource or suggestion for us for how we can direct them. Yeah, I one I can't um, recommend materials or products. We have to be material agnostic, um, especially since we didn't en get engage in the development of those products. But I would say, you know, it's always about like figuring out locally what the best solutions are for the place you're um, that you are in, right? And so, you know, where can you advise on reuse? Where you can advise on shared community, not um, handing off trinkets and stuff like that. You know, like 
all of these materials, even if you're if you're talking about something made of wood, uh, that can come from that comes from forestry and we address deforestation. If you're talking about something made of glass that comes from sand and we're dealing with folks trying to mine our seabeds and our um, and our shores, which leads to erosion, right? Um, so all of these things come from a resource that our planet has and have to be recycled. So if it is, you know, I think it's about encouraging them to think about those things and, you know, find local sources who can help match that system where, um, whether it's a reuse or, you know, like a recycle, something that can be recyclable in that place, right? Um, and that's how you can sort of um, find the best recommendation. Okay, well, that is um, that it's such a for us, it is such a challenging right. thing yeah. because hundreds and thousands of these bags are being used all the time everywhere. And um, and I it's just tough to to figure out how to advise people um, yeah. on this particular thing. But thank you yeah, for those, those bags are not recyclable. Films today are not recyclable. And that's really a problem. Um, there's the unnecessary bags that we have, and then there is the films that are used for protein packaging that, um, you know, help us to reduce food waste, but also are not recyclable. So it's it's tough, um, but it is tough. We encourage people to reuse the clamshells. You know, we we we, yeah. we you know reach for things, but it's it's just tough. And I know that hundreds of thousands of these bags are being used all the time everywhere yeah. around us. And I just, you know, so anyways, it'll be fulfilled at some point, but just thank you for tossing, letting me toss that question out. No problem. So, uh, along that line, um, Aaron, there have been a couple questions and I, you may not be able to, based on what you just said, <laughs> answer this question, but a lot of people are wondering about the biodegradable plastics. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that something is that, is, you know, is we're talking yeah. single use, is, is that a good alternative? I've heard mixed things once they get in a landfill, they don't get access to sun and air and yeah. water and everything. They're still just going to sit there. I don't, I don't know for sure. <laughs> so the What's your take? A biodegradable or compostable is to recover those materials back, to have them go back to nature. And you're right, that stuff going into a landfill, especially a sealed landfill, those things are not breaking down. And in many cases, when those get littered into nature, they are also not breaking down. Just because from um, there are certain parameters, there's like there's relative humidity, there's temperature, there's UV, you know, there's different types of bacteria that are needed to break these things down. And all of the data we have around plastic pollution is that in nature, it is problematic. And so no matter how long it takes to break down, it is not a benefit. So if you are designing things for compost and biodegradability, you want to match that with the infrastructure. If you're designing for recycling or reuse, you want to match it with infrastructure. A recyclable bottle that never goes to a recycling facility will not get recycled. A reusable bottle that cannot be reused will not get reused. And a compostable bottle that does not have an industrial composter will not get composted, right? And so this is this is the thing. You have to match the solution with it, right? And that is the same for if you move to an alternative, if you move to a paper or a glass or an aluminum, if there is not recycling for those materials, if there's not policy, if there's not infrastructure, like those things are not going to be recycled or reused or composted. So we always say that you need to match the technology to the infrastructure. If it doesn't exist, then you are not gonna have that happen. If not, it's probably gonna end up in a landfill. And then it's just in a landfill, okay. hanging out. Okay, all right, there's some questions going on in the chat. Paper yeah. bag versus a plastic bag, you know, what's what's better there, right? you know? Yeah. I mean, the paper versus plastic debate was has been going on for decades. Yeah. Right? Nothing on this planet comes without impact, right? It's just, I, you know, I can do a comparison of the impacts of the, the water and the material and the energy used to make paper versus the materials that are used to make plastics and they they differ where they have benefits and concerns both of them however are taking resources for our planet and are very rarely getting recycled the way they need to paper you can recycle it more readily if you are actively doing that and you have recycling right um so i would say use a reusable bag don't use a single use bag this is a mm -hmm. case where reduction is probably the right step right um uh, so I would always say if you can reduce, that's the first step. 
you know, I think of, I go through my kitchen, like, do I have Ziplocs anymore? I do not, you know, do I, you know, do I have, um, plastic uh what is it called the stuff that the stuff that you wrap around things we do not have anymore right we use like wax or we use resealable containers um you know we don't use straws in our household that are single use and we do have I saw somebody say you have to have the brush yeah you know I'm a big shake person love my shake my smoothie but I just like clean my straw with my brush and it's just you know so I think there's all these ways that you can think about what those materials are without having that single use convenience and honestly it, it, make it work for your family. Um, right. We've even gotten rid of paper towel. We use just um, cloth shop towels that go into a yeah. little laundry basket under our table and then we wash them every day. So I mean or every week. So yeah. Um, yeah. How about, um, maybe we'll go to a question from um, Silky. You wanna unmute yourself? Just un unmute your mic, Silky. Okay, am I unmuted? I think yes. so. Yes. <laughs> so um, I wanted to uh, make some comments that are all targeted towards raising awareness. And in that context, I find it extremely motivating to see that we have 512 people on this call. Yeah. Um, and the reason I say that is because I uh, I grew up in Germany, if it wasn't clear from my comments that I left in the chat, and um, they are very good in recycling and raising awareness. Are they perfect? No, absolutely not. There's room for improvement everywhere. But I think there is a generally much higher level of awareness of the problematic in Europe, in part because that country is so small, they can't afford landfills. They have to have other solutions, such as, you know, industry that burns the plastic, which comes with its own problems. Um, but I'm missing the awareness here in the US in particular. Like, I run around with my plastic bottles. We go out with friends a lot on vacation. And I'm always being smiled upon when I say, hey, do we have to use the, you know, do we have to buy the plastic bottles? Can't we just do reusables, right? And there are other aspects like that going along with the actual recycling and, and else. And that is really hard to combat, you know, like standing your ground and trying to educate people on what is right when you encounter this kind of ignorance. And the only way I see that this can be fixed in the long haul is that we start educating our young. And I don't see that enough in schools. Um, my kids had have had some projects, but they are all um, very head centered. And without showing these pictures, you had a very nice turtle in in a net, right? Well, that looked like a really nice picture. I um, recently visited an exhibit on the ocean um, in Germany, including um, a section that dealt with the problematic of plastics and microplastics to sea life, um, et cetera. Those pictures and images were not so pretty. And I think we need to appeal to the emotions of people also if we want to get somewhere, because you need to be aware of the cruelty that this can cause, of the ugliness that it looks like on our shores or rivers where all this stuff is being, you know, dumped or ends up being, um, you know, transported to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, events like today's, I think it would be really nice to make that more available um, on a state, on a county base, for example, for teachers to use as, you know, materials for just, you know, making sure our kids understand why um, we are dwelling on that. Um, 
Well, I can I can give you a PSA that we just put out. Um, I hope this is the right link. Um, uh, it was really great. You two gave us the um, rights to use Beautiful Day for the first time ever for free. And so we've been had this um, plastic pollution video out and we have a whole new engagement platform right now, which um, shows photos of a pile of trash and a, and a child, which is just lovely. But um, to to kind of touch on a couple of things that you pointed to, um, one, yes, globally, waste management is very inequitable, like all things in the world. Um, and some of the things we're trying to do with the treaty and through private sector dollars and um, development banks is to make sure that we are um, enabling and supporting from a financial and a capacity perspective, um, those um, smaller economies, SMEs and M. Um, E MEs like in their ability to implement because if we are not all successful globally in this, we will all fail, right? It's a it's a thing that we are going to win and lose together. In regards to um, like awareness raising, you know, WWF uh, spends a lot of our time engaging with those who have the greatest power to change, but a lot of time um, trying to educate schools. We have a program. Um, called Wild Classroom, where we have an entire plastic pollution um, set of free materials, and we do uh, go out to schools with that. Um, but it can't just be us. It's going to be a lot of others. So I highlight that we are just one organization, while large, we are not the only one uh, doing this work. But we are trying to raise awareness around this. We're partnering with others to to get more um, uh, to get more artists to put reuse requirements in their riders for contracts with um, concert venues, um, working with the Green Sports Alliance to do the same thing around um, sports. You know, you got to kind of come from all different directions because our, you know, like you were saying, whether it's the human health or the trash and the impact on species, different cultures value those things differently. Um, and, and what will incentivize them to change is definitely very varied. So um, lots to um, lots to really think about when trying to engage those different populations, but we are trying. Um, and so I think it will be important though, it's important for you to continue bringing that single use water bottle and continuing to say to your friends, like the reason I use this is because it's better. Also, I'm not spending all this money buying a million water bottles every time. If it doesn't work about the planet, tell them how much money they can save. <laughs> uh, Cause you know, so everybody's incentivized in different ways, but we appreciate all of you do like all that you're doing. That's great. Yeah, I'm sure we I'm sure a lot of people on this call can resonate with that because we are the people who who um, have an interest. Um, I guess let's go to Mary Ellen or Marie Ellen. You um, have been waiting to ask a question, so. You can just unmute your mic, Mary, Mary Ellen. Hello. Hi, um, yep. I was, <laughs> You're on. you touched on it a little bit. Um, uh, biopolymers versus compostables. Um, can you speak a little bit more about those? Um, and my understanding is there's only something like a hundred places that do industrial scale composting in the US and they only primarily take yard waste. So yeah. is this something that is is a viable alternative to consider? Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, of all the things you propose, I, I, I know you're saying go with all of them, but what would give us the most bang for the buck? And then yeah. in addition to the, discussing polymers versus biopolymers and compostable and oh. um, something that I thought of uh, when uh, Silky was talking W, if WWF goes back to the images that they published in the 1970s when they were talking about industrial pollution, I, I, I remember all those national and world wildlife magazines that had very startling pictures. I don't know if you're putting those out anymore, but I'm sure they had a lot to do with getting our environment, our waterways cleaned up in, in the 80s and 90s. So anyway, I'll let you answer no worries. So bioplastics, so bio-based versus compost. Those are, I want to highlight here that what something is made of and how it is managed when it is done are two separate things. 
something can be bio-based and recyclable and not compostable, or something can be bio-based and compostable, or something can be bio-based and it cannot be recyclable or compostable. You can also have non-bio-based things that are compostable. So it is important that we separate those two. If you're talking about sourcing something, coming from a, a resource that could be renewable, if managed responsibly, then that is when we look at the bio base. So we have this program called Bioplace, um, Bioplastic Feedstock Alliance, and it really digs into if you're shifting from a non-renewable resource like oil, gas, petroleum, and to a bio base one, what do you have to think about from a land use, um, in environment, social, human health, food waste and food loss and food competition? Um, what do you have to think about in order to produce it? And then you think about Again, matching it with the infrastructure, uh, you have to um, you have to say if there is a composter and you and you're saying something is compostable, you can only say it's compostable in that area if the facility exists. You said, is this a viable solution? This compostability, and I think honestly, um, that's a question that everybody is asking right now as they are trying to put their dollars in different places, right? Most people aren't betting big on compost. Food waste is where that's happening, right? Food waste and yard waste. But from a materials perspective, because you can get, you can't get a material out of a compost, right? You can't go material to material. So composting doesn't actually reduce the demand on the planet in the first place. You still have to go back and ask for more, even if it composts, right? Because it's not giving you another product. And so I think what, what you're finding is that people are addressing like circular infrastructure as the big win, which is recycling and reuse, different ways that you can cascade the value of that material, whether about processing it again or just reusing it as is. But bigger than that, they're starting with reduction. So that's where I would, I would go with that. Um, and I would say, honestly, when you guys are talking about these campaigns of the past, one, um, social media is a different beast. It didn't exist then. But two, policies. It's policy that's really driving that. So the Clean Air, the Clean um, Water Act, these are really important today to help us to define what chemicals. But we do need to be better. It, we do need better policies in on managing the production and the use and the recovery of these materials. Great. They do do better. Silgate, so so when you were talking about compost, like we personally compost food in our house. But we don't compost any materials, just food. So composting for food waste is important. Just it's not as it's not that I don't think it's the the big the big win for materials. Right. Um, Julie, did you have another question? Your hand has been up for a while or was that from no, previous? My apologies, one? that's a tech error. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Let's move to Jennifer. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I find takeout containers are a big, a big problem. And um, so we try to only take out from places that have eco containers or take our own, you know, Tupperware to get um, takeout if that's possible. But is yeah. there a list? Is there a list somewhere that's available that lists restaurants that have eco containers or um, could that be something that could work, be worked out with TripAdvisor or, you know, some of these, you know, online um yeah Jennifer I think you just thought of a new <laughs> app <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I mean yeah we We're work local, with yeah. yeah we work with Uber Eats on this type of thing um there we work with Google on the on what you can opt in and out of and how you can rate um, there's a lot of different ways to engage in this. There's a lot of great um, new organizations that are popping up that are partnering with all of these, like with an Uber Eats in an area like New York with the reusable materials to be used and you can give them back. Um, I know there is a reuse program in um, the, the DC area, but I don't, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, so yeah, I would say those are all great ideas for addressing that. Um, I think uh, small island states are really are really challenged by this because um, they have very limited infrastructure and so they are they are challenged by the amount of waste they proliferate. So um, and um, in in a big takeout sort of culture regularly. So great. Um, actually, someone in the in the um, 
chat said follow plastic free restaurants in IG. So I think that, that was Julie. Um, uh, in Instagram, right? Okay. Interesting. We'll have to look that one up. Um, Mary Ellen, did you have another question? Marie Ellen. Yeah, sorry. this is more of a technical one. Actually, it's I go by Emmy. Uh, but you wouldn't know that. Is there a way to get a copy of the chat? There has been some really good <laughs> ideas, good, good, good links, good everything, and 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 teams will not let me copy chat. Um, is, is there a way you can provide that yeah, to us? Yeah, I will work on that. I usually do that. It, it is an, an easy thing to do, but I can go back and copy and paste, and and we've done it before. And yes, I agree. We can do that again. So. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to ask your question? We're getting toward the end of time, but I think we can get another one in. <clears throat> yes, unmute your mic, Elizabeth. Sorry, <laughs> I don't have a question, thanks. Okay. Great. Um, how about Maria? Don't forget to unmute. Okay, she can't unmute. Um, well, then let's let's move to Rosie. Maria said she posted her question in the chat. I'm just scrolling to look for it. Oh, it was about the bamboo. Oh, okay. So bamboo, um, just like anything made of wood, just has to be sustainably sourced. Um, look at um, uh, FSC, forest, um, just, uh, forest, like the forestry sustainability um, consortiums that certify pulp and paper and wood products um, for you know, making sure that they are truly adhering to sustainable forestry practices, the same with bamboo. And then bamboo can be recycled um, with um, wood products, so. I'd like okay. to jump in on this one. Be careful with with uh, bio, biologic-based uh, uh, bowls and stuff. Some of them are not approved for food use. Um, there, there, are, there are things out there that Thank you. That's a great point to make sure we're doing our due diligence. Let's um like we have, let's just finish with Rosie. Last question. Unmute your mic, Rosie. Go ahead. Rosie Berman, you can unmute your mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for all your information. My question is that uh, I know maybe I missed a part of this uh, conversation um, webinar is how about the aluminum uh, foils? These are recyclable. Uh, it will depend on your area. Uh, some folks will take aluminum foil if some uh, if it is balled up. Some won't. Um, so aluminum is infinitely recyclable, um, but it just depends on the um, it depends on whether or not your recycling company will take it and recycle it. So I would I would look at your local recycling facility and find out what they accept. Okay. Thanks. Great. Well, I think that's that's all the time we have today. Um, John, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Aaron, for the fantastic presentation. We are grateful to have you speak with us. We will be emailing a survey to all attendees today to get your feedback. What went well and if there's any areas of improvement. The recording of the session will be posted on our HHS YouTube 
Go Green, Get Healthy HHS playlist in the next few weeks. Um, and I'll drop that in the chat and check out the playlist of the Earth Day speaker series and the HHS Green Champion Awards winners. And for more information about the Go Green, Get Healthy HHS sustainability program, visit our website on the HHS internet. I'll put that in the chat. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email gogreen at hhs.gov. I'll drop that in the chat now too. Thanks, thank you all for attending and sharing your comments and questions on these important issues. Uh, and thank, thank you again, Aaron, and uh, so much. And everyone have a great day.